Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to Hebrews uh, chapter 8. So we're continuing our Advent series in the book of Hebrews, taking a break from Leviticus for a few weeks here, but we're not completely disconnecting from Leviticus because Hebrews takes some of the central themes that we've been seeing in Leviticus and shows how they are fulfilled in Jesus and were intended to be all along. So Advent is part of a big story. So you may have a favorite moment in a favorite story or novel of yours, and you can read that little section to a friend, but they're not going to understand the significance of it unless they've read the whole. So you can't grasp the birth of Jesus and its massive significance without understanding the backstory. His arrival is fulfilling promises and hopes that were cultivated for centuries before. So this is why we're calling the series Fulfilled. It's about how Jesus came at Advent to fulfill the promises from long before, and He also fulfills our deepest needs and longings. So last week we saw that Jesus, at Advent, Jesus came as the true and better priest. And this morning, we see that Jesus came to bring a new and better covenant. So this is the point of Hebrews chapter 8. The book of Hebrews is constantly quoting the Old Testament, and in chapter 8, maybe you look down at the text in front of you. By the way, if you don't have a Bible with you, this is on page um, 1005 in the Bibles near chairs nearby, so grab one of those. And just looking at your page, you may see a big section of this chapter um, is set off from the rest, and because it's a quotation from the Old Testament, and this is not only the longest quotation of the Old Testament in the book of Hebrews, which quotes the Old Testament a lot, but it's the longest quotation of the Old Testament in the New Testament. It's one of the greatest and most important promises God has ever made. The quote is from Jeremiah 31, and it's the promise of the new covenant. So Advent is about how Jesus came to bring this promised new covenant. So if you want to know what Christmas is about, if you want to know why Jesus came, if you want to know how to communicate this to other people, this is the heart of it. Three promises here in the new covenant are the very essence of real Christianity and the meaning of Advent. So let's read chapter 8 beginning in verse 6 together, and then we'll pray. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this great promise, collection of promises that you gave your people, and we thank you that you brought them to fulfillment through Jesus, and we're living in the time of fulfillment. So we pray that you would open our minds and hearts to grasp the wonder of these great promises, and in doing this, that we would see your very heart and your kindness and your love and your mercy and grace, and that we'd honor you for that. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are three primary promises of the new covenant here, and Advent is about Jesus coming to make good on those three promises. So we can think of gifts at Advent and Christmas, and occasionally you may open a gift that has 
more than one gift inside. So you open the box, and turns out there's three gifts inside. So that's what the new covenant is. It's the gift of Advent with three gifts within it, three promises that really sum up Christianity in what Jesus came to give us. So what are they? Transformation, relationship, and forgiveness. A transformed life, a real relationship with our Maker, and full forgiveness forever. So before we look at these, let's first see from this text our need for this new covenant, because that's what the author draws attention to first, and then we'll consider these three great promises. So first is our need for this new covenant. Why do we need it? Well, let's get caught up on the flow of thought in the chapter here. So last Sunday, we saw that Jesus came as the priest to end all priests. All the Old Testament priests were temporary and preparing a way for Jesus. So Taylor showed us that Jesus is the greatest priest that we could ever have and the only priest we'll ever need. And now the author says that Jesus has brought, as the new priest, he now has a ministry and he's brought a better covenant. So this is verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. And he'll continue this flow of thought into chapter 9 and 10, like we'll see in the next few weeks about this greater ministry of Jesus. But here, he pauses to quote Jeremiah 31 to show the greatness of this covenant that he brings. He has a better ministry because he brings a better covenant, which is enacted on better promises. So, what is a covenant? Well, it's a formal agreement that serves a relationship. So, marriages are covenants. We enter into a new agreement about how this relationship is going to work. So God entered into a covenant relationship with Israel in the Old Testament, and now Jesus has come to bring a better relationship and agreement. So here's how the author makes his case here. The author is writing to Christians who had, uh, most of these likely had a Jewish background, and now they're finding that following Jesus is a liability. They're tempted then to leave Jesus because of the social ostracism they're experiencing or financial consequences of not being accepted in certain areas in the social world of their time or even the threat of physical violence. Um, Some are already imprisoned, it seems, as we read later in Hebrews. And so they're tempted to leave Jesus and go back to the way things were before them. Just let's forget about the new that's come. Let's just go back to the old. God gave it anyway, right? Right? It's good. We, we had a temple. We had priests. We had the old covenant. Let's just go back to that. And the author throughout this book is saying you can't do that. Now that Jesus has come, the old is gone. It's fulfilled. And Jesus is infinitely better anyway. He's the end of the story. Here's, he's where it was all heading all along. He's the whole point of it. And he says, I'm going to make the case for you from the Old Testament itself. So he's writing to people who would have held the Old Testament as authority, and he's saying, I want to show you not just from Jesus' life and ministry and the new things we've learned that this surpasses the old. I want to show you from your book, from the Old Testament itself, from God's very word, that the Old Covenant was not enough and was pointing forward to Jesus. And so, verses 7 and 8, he says this, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault, God finds fault with them when he says, and then he quotes Jeremiah 31 from the Old Testament. So here's the logic. He's saying the first covenant, the old covenant, was not enough. And we know this from reading the Old Testament itself. Because he's quoting from Jeremiah saying, look right here in Jeremiah, read it for yourself. A new and better covenant was promised by God in the Old Testament. That means the first one was not enough. So, kind of a side note here, if if you want to engage the book of Hebrews more deeply, if you haven't done that before, um, that would be a great book to be reading through for Advent and even this series. If you want to understand how the book of Hebrews works, because it's kind of dense, tight arguments, it, it works like this in topic after topic. He says, you think the Old Testament setup was better than Jesus. Like, you're tempted to think that. But let me show you from the Old Testament that it was looking ahead to Jesus 
as bringing a better reality. So you think the land was enough. Well, Psalm 95 says a better rest is coming. You think the priests were enough. Well, Psalm 110 said a better priest is coming. You think the tabernacle was enough. Well, Exodus 25 said that it was a pattern of something better. You think sacrifices were enough. A better sacrifice was coming. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin anyway. So in topic after topic after topic, the author's convincing the readers from the Old Testament that Jesus is better. And here he says, you think the Old Covenant was enough. Jeremiah 31 in the Old Testament said a new and better one was coming. So what was wrong with the first or what was inadequate with the first that a second is needed? Well, there's two problems. There was a problem with the people and there was a problem with the covenant. The problem with the people was that they were not able to keep the covenant. And the problem with the covenant is that it didn't have strong enough promises that would enable the people to keep the covenant. So he explains this in verse 9. We'll take a couple minutes on this so we can just understand the logic here. He explains this in verse 9. He says, this is not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. So I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. So he says that God found fault with them that the first covenant was not faultless. And then he says this, saying that that previous covenant, they didn't continue in it. So let's not misunderstand. The old covenant was gracious. God took them by the hand, he says, when he brought them out of Egypt. He rescued them. He forgave their sin through sacrifices. Even his commands were given for their good. It was a gracious covenant in many ways, but it didn't promise enough. So it gave the people commands but then it didn't change their hearts so that they could obey them. So it called the people. It, God called Israel, and the first covenant called them to love him and obey him. But their sin was too deep. And so the covenant would not work with a people who just refuse to love God and hold fast to him and trust him and obey him. It wasn't looking for perfect obedience in the way that it was set up. There's sacrifices that cover it. So it's not like... It's not like God set up this legalistic scenario, and if they just broke one command, it was, it was over. He had sacrifices for that. He was calling them to love Him and trust Him and obey Him truly, even if not perfectly at that time, but they couldn't do that. So those are the two problems. The people are responsible to love and obey God, but they failed, and the covenant didn't have promises strong enough to deal with that problem. So the covenant could command Israel, but it couldn't transform them to obey. So here's what it's like. You have um, a beater of a car, and everything's been slowly falling apart. This is two car illustrations, two weeks in a row, I suppose. And then you got into an accident, and now it's also just mangled. The frame is jacked up. The brakes hardly work. The brake fluid's leaking everywhere. The interior's ripped up. The windshield's shattered. The engine has all sorts of problems. So you take it to um, kind of a situation that's both a body shop and also has a good mechanic. They give it a new windshield. They clean up the bodywork. They replace the interior. They fix the brakes, give it new tires. They fresh paint. Everything looks great. But the one thing they didn't do is replace the engine. And so the engine starts, but it's puttering, and you need to take a trip. And you're not going to get there because this thing's not getting out of first gear. It's starting to overheat. It's burning oil. And you can tell there's something wrong with the piston. So you are not going to get to where you need to go. So what's the problem? Well, is the problem with the body shop and the mechanic? Or is the problem with the car? Well, the car's the real problem, right? It's the engine. That's the problem. The mechanic was good, but the mechanic didn't fix the deepest problem. So you need a new engine. You need a better mechanic. As good as he is, you need a better one. So the car's the problem, but you also need a better mechanic. Both of them are inadequate to solve this situation. That's the situation with the old covenant. The covenant was good, but it wasn't enough. So the problem was with the people and the covenant. The people are the deepest problem. They have the heart issue. They refuse to love the Lord. They refuse to trust Him. They are incapable of obeying Him. But the covenant itself was inadequate 
for them. And so that's the situation with Israel. What's the solution? Well, God promised a new and better covenant with better promises. This is what Jesus brought at Advent. The new covenant is now here. That's why he came. And he's now fulfilled these promises and brought a covenant that surpasses the old. So this is the great gift that Jesus brings at Advent to the world. And so now we open that and look inside and we find three gifts, three promises. So let's walk through those now. The first promise is transformation. This is verse 10. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. So in the Old Covenant, this is a contrast, right? The Old Covenant, God wrote the laws on stone and he told the people to put it in their hearts. This was a loving and gracious thing to do, but the people didn't do it. So now God says, here's the new covenant. I will put the law in your heart. So this solves the deepest problem of humanity's entrenched disobedience. This section of Hebrews is now just a long block quotation from Jeremiah. And listen to Jeremiah's description of Israel's condition. So here's an example. If you turn back, you don't need to now, but if you were to turn back to Jeremiah and just read Jeremiah building up to Jeremiah 31, which is quoted here in Hebrews, here's the kind of thing you'd, you'd read repeatedly. Jeremiah 11, 4 says that God refers to the Old Covenant. He says that Israel was to obey him, and they would be his people, and he'd be their God. But what happened? We go on to read this in verse 8. They did not obey or incline their ear, but everyone walked in the stubbornness of his evil heart. And this happened in generation after generation after generation. I mean, remember they broke the covenant from day one with the golden calf while they're receiving the law? And then in Jeremiah 11, it continues to say this, they've turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words. They've gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant that I made with their fathers. So here's how we can summarize the relationship between God and Israel in the Old Testament. This isn't working. And it's not just Israel that had the problem. Israel had the best shot. All the other nations were already walking in idolatry, rejecting their creator. Israel had the best shot. God rescued them. He gave them his law. He revealed himself. He was patient with them and kind and gracious. And yet Israel and every other person has this problem of the human heart. The problem is with humanity. The problem is with the car's engine. The problem is in our heart. Or you could think of it this way. Every one of our hearts has polarity. So what happens when you put two strong magnets close together? Well, it depends, right? Depends which way it's flipped. Flipped one way, stuck together, and sometimes it can seem impossible to get it apart. Um, flipped the other way, you can put as much force as you want and you're not going to get those magnets to touch. So that's our situation. That's what the human heart is like ever since sin entered the world. We are repelled from God. No matter how close you bring us, just like God being gracious to Israel and bringing them to himself, no matter how close we get, it's not going to work because our hearts are flipped the wrong way. Our hearts are flipped toward ourselves. Big capital S. Self, that's what we live for. So Hebrews 8 quotes Jeremiah 31 to show that God promised to deal with this problem. He promised to transform the heart. He he promised to change the direction that the magnet was facing. He promised to replace the engine. So rather than putting law on stone and telling them to obey, God is now going to put the law in the heart so that we want to obey. So the law will no longer just rule over us like a taskmaster that we resist. Instead, it will be put inside of us as a blessing that we relish. So there's other places in the Old Testament that expand on this promise. So in Jeremiah 32, 40, so just a chapter after where this quote is coming from, God says this, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me, or the the awe, the, the reverent trust of me, 
in their hearts that they may not turn from me. So do you see how that's, this is solving the problem of the Old Testament and the human heart? That the heart, even when it turns to God, turns away and God is saying, I'm going to bring a covenant that's going to have this promise. I will put a reverent trust of me inside their heart so that they won't turn away. I'm going to bring them to myself. I'm going to turn them to myself. I'm, going to nev- I'm never going to stop doing them good and they will never leave me and forsake me and I'll never leave them and forsake them. Ezekiel 36, 26 says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. This is the text that Jesus is drawing on when he talks about the new birth, when he says, you must be born again, born of the Spirit. He says, I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I'll put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you, and I love this statement, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This isn't just like a second chance. This is solving the problem. God says, in this covenant, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and obey my rules. I will cause you to obey, and not against our wills. He's going to change our wills so that we want to obey. So he's no longer just going to command hard hearts. He's going to give new hearts. He's going to replace the engine. So this is at the heart of the good news of Advent and Christmas. And why is this good news? Well, in order to see how it's good news, we have to see what this is not saying. So this is not saying the old covenant asked people to obey God, but what a relief in the new covenant that doesn't matter anymore. It's just kind of faith, kind of a mental agreement with facts and obedience isn't important anymore. It also doesn't say, in the Old Testament, God said His commands matter, but now they don't matter. No, the promise is not that God will no longer require His people to obey or that His commands don't matter anymore. The promise is that we actually will obey. So it would be bad news, wouldn't it? I mean, think about this. It would be bad news if the new covenant said, essentially, God said His people, I know you all hate me and resist me, Your hearts are turned against me, you hate my good commands, and you're making a wreck of your life and everyone else's. Uh, But don't worry, Uh, I'm going to bring a new covenant where I'm not going to care anymore that you disobey me. Like, it's just not going to matter anymore. So what's going to happen here is as long as you kind of have a certain idea of trust in me, then go ahead and ruin your life, continue to make a wreck of it, but then when you die, we'll kind of get that all sorted out. Like, that'd be terrible, right? That would not be good news. No, instead, the promise is, I'm going to replace your engine. I'm going to change the polarity of your heart. You're going to have new spiritual taste buds so that you want to obey. You'll love what is true and good and beautiful. You'll you'll never fall away from me because I'll see to it that you won't. I'll cause you to obey. So some of you may hear this and you have this category already. Some of you may hear this and uh, what you may be doing and not even know it is you're trying to fit this into a theological category you already have, but it's kind of having to get minimized and reduced to fit. So what we need if, is a new category if you don't have this already. So many Christians try to get this to, uh, to fit their categories they have and so they minimize it and some hear then that this and then think this. You're kind of trying to fit it into categories you already have. Wow, this is amazing. All those who of their own accord make the decision to trust and follow Jesus, God then will respond by helping them obey even more as long as they keep letting Him help them. But God's right there to help them. What a great promise. But that would, that would shrink this promise, actually. This is saying that we can't trust and follow Jesus until He changes our hearts. He has to change our hearts in order for us to want Him. He has to change the polarity of our hearts so that we turn to Him and cling to Him. He's the one who works in our hearts in such a way that we would desire Jesus and that we'd follow Jesus and that we'd want to follow Jesus. So if you are a Christian, then you have experienced this because Advent has happened. God has given you a new heart to trust Him. He's changed your desires, and you are growing 
in obedience to him. Not perfectly, but truly, because he has put the fear of him, the, the reverent trust in him, in your heart. And he is making good on that promise in Ezekiel and Jeremiah to cause you to walk in his ways. We're experiencing this as a church family. Because of Advent, we are not like Israel or the nations of the Old Testament era. And we dishonor Jesus and the greatness of Advent if we don't recognize this. God is transforming people. So yes, we have a million miles to go before we would be perfect, and we can't get there in this life. But that doesn't mean that real change isn't happening. If you are in Christ, you're in the new covenant, and God has put His law in your heart. For others of you, you are in Christ, but you do recognize that there's far too little change that's happened in your life. So I want to encourage you to let this hope for change motivate you to change. So even just knowing that this is a reality can actually help you grow, right? If you don't even think change is possible, you're going to stay discouraged and demotivated to even try, right? But if you know that in the new covenant, you have the Holy Spirit within you, you have God's promise to cause you to walk in His ways, you have a, you have a new desires put in your heart. That actually is motivating for you to actually pursue the change that He empowers you to do. So, just be encouraged and freshly motivated then to pursue change with some of even your entrenched sins and unhelpful patterns. And others of you, you may recognize that you are maybe more like a completely fixed up car, but with a broken engine. Looks good on the outside, but all these indicators problems are starting to flash inside. And so your life looks good, but it's not working, and you know you need a new heart. And so this is what it means to become a Christian. And Christmas is about Jesus coming to bring transformation. So trust Jesus. If you even sense in your heart right now that you're beginning to trust Him, it's because He Himself is at work in you. So take heart. And this is the first promise of Advent then. Jesus came to bring transformation. So the second promise is relationship. Now, you may think, okay, if this is contrasting in the Old Testament, God already had a relationship with His people in the Old Testament, right? Well, yes, in a sense. He did have a relationship with Israel as a nation, and there were certainly a number of Israelites within the nation who knew God in a saving, personal way, right? Abraham, Moses, Rahab, Joshua, Ruth, David, Abigail, so forth. But Israel as a whole was a mixed group. Some had a personal and saving relationship with God, but it seems that most didn't. Those who truly knew Him and did obey Him were referred to as a remnant. They were this smaller portion within the nation of Israel. So in verse 11 here, it promises that everyone in the new covenant will know the Lord. Instead of being a mixed community, everyone will know the Lord. So Verse 11 says this, And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. So this implies, as far as I can tell, in the Old Covenant, the people had to evangelize each other. Right? They had to say to one another, Know the Lord. And the prophets had to keep telling people to turn to God, seek Him, repent, and so forth. They were a deeply wayward people. But the new covenant is different. In this covenant, everyone will know the Lord. No one will need to evangelize the other members of this covenant because everyone in this covenant will know and trust the Lord. So this is a contrast between the two covenants, and this is a key to understanding the nature of Christianity and the church and how it's different than Old Testament Israel. So the Old Covenant was for those who were physically born into the people of Israel or joined, and they may or may not personally know the Lord. God made the Old Covenant with an ethnic people, so you're born into it. And then all the males are circumcised as infants. So they take the sign of the covenant as infants because they're part of the covenant as infants. So because you can be part of the covenant 
without truly knowing and loving and obeying God. But now in the new covenant, everyone in this covenant has a new heart and knows God. So no one is physically born into the new covenant. This is why Jesus said you must be born again. So you have to be spiritually reborn into this covenant. Now this doesn't mean that everyone who claims to know God is a real believer who knows the Lord. Jesus said some people who claim to know him and even do miracles in his name, he will say, I never knew you. It's Matthew 7. So you can look like a Christian and look like you're in the new covenant and actually not be one. You can claim to be part of the new covenant, but not be in the covenant because all members in this covenant are believers. So this is why we teach um, and practice believers' baptism as a church. The sign of the new covenant, we believe, is not for those who are physically born into it, but are spiritually reborn into it. So baptism is an outward expression of this inward new covenant reality. It's a sign that you are in the new covenant and united to Christ by faith. So of course we uh, don't do this perfectly and many people can be baptized and not part of the new covenant. But the point is the ideal that we're aiming for is to have uh, baptism and membership in a local church match the new covenant reality. That's different than the old covenant. You give the sign to infants because they're in the covenant regardless of whether or not they do end up knowing God. But in the new covenant, we take care to give baptism to those who give evidence that they're in the covenant. This is also why we pursue what some call regenerate church membership. So regeneration, theological term for the new birth, the new heart given in the new covenant. So we want membership to match the new covenant reality. We want to be able to affirm that someone is trusting in Jesus. They're united to him by faith. And so that's why we have members go through Discover ZF and share their faith with an elder. This is why we pray for our children to receive new hearts. No one is part of the new covenant just because they were born into a Christian home or because they attend church. It's very common for Christian parents to just assume that their children have the new birth, even if there's not evidence that there's actually new desires for the Lord put inside of them. And so we pray for our children to receive the new heart and to know Christ. So that's the second great promise that is brought with the new covenant, relationship. Third promise is forgiveness. This is verse 12. It says, For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. So in the old covenant, the sacrifices always pointed forward to Jesus Those who were truly repentant and trusting in God and His promises received forgiveness. They did so because those sacrifices would be fulfilled in Jesus. But now that Jesus has come, He's made the once for all sacrifice. And we'll focus on this in a couple weeks. He's paid our debt. He's purchased our full forgiveness. There's nothing we can do that can earn this forgiveness. And this total forgiveness is so radical that we often have a hard time psychologically believing this. So Martin Luther, great leader of the Reformation, recovery of the gospel, of faith in Jesus, faith alone, he'd also say things like, it's almost impossible to believe the gospel. And he'd just say, week after week, I keep preaching the gospel because week after week, we keep coming in here looking like we don't believe it. Because it is so hard to actually believe in full forgiveness, in justification, being declared righteous by faith alone. So you can believe in this as a doctrine. You may know in your head that you are forgiven, but don't you also sometimes do this? When you mess up big time, you feel guilt and shame, and so you kind of sulk for a couple days before you turn to the Lord. Do you ever do that? You, you wait for a period of time to go by that you felt guilty enough for a while And then you turn back to God. Now, why not just do it right away? If Jesus died for even those sins, can't you you go to him and seek and receive that fresh forgiveness a millisecond after you commit that sin? Right? If, If you repent to him, can't you do that? But we can sometimes wait because what's going on is we feel, we assume that in some kind of subconscious way that God will not accept our repentance immediately until we felt guilty for a while. And that changes the gospel to 
Christ, not Christ alone anymore, but Jesus plus a day of guilty feelings. And this shows that we believe the gospel uh, in theory, but it hasn't saturated our hearts like it could. Jesus paid it all, though. We have complete forgiveness in Him. So, after even a massive failing, you can come directly to Him. You can say, I've done it again. Please take me back. I'm so sorry. And you can thank Him because He does. He's brought a new covenant. He's purchased us. So those are the three promises, transformation, relationship, and forgiveness. And they are here because of Advent. They're here because Jesus came to us. And this is for all of His people, everyone in this new covenant. Now, quick side note, if you read Jeremiah and the quote, you might have noted that it says this is a promise for Israel and Judah. And so this is part of understanding how the whole Bible fits together and how Jesus comes. Jesus came as the true Israelite, and he brought the gospel to the house of Israel and Judah first, which is why he went first to the Jews, and they received the gospel message first. And then the gospel, as Gentiles, non-Jews were trickling in, the gospel burst out into the world for, because in the Old Testament itself, it was to expand, the people of God were to expand to include people that were non-Israelites. So this is a promise for the New Testament people of God, the new covenant, it is fulfilled And so this is the point of verse 13. The author quotes Jeremiah 31, and then he sums it up like this. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So the new covenant was promised, and the old started to vanish away, and now it's gone. Because Christ is here. So Advent, it's about the arrival of the new covenant in Jesus. And this means that there is real hope for transformation. You can really know God, and you can have full and total forgiveness of your sins. You can bring the real you to the real Jesus. All your real sins and failures to Him. All your real need for change to Him. And He's happy to take you. So let's live with great thankfulness this Advent for all these promises. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the new covenant. We thank you that you made your promises now be a match to our need in our deeply sinful hearts. We thank you that you bring transformation. We thank you for the full forgiveness through Jesus. We thank you for the Spirit's presence in our hearts to cause us to obey you. Thank you for not leaving us in not only our guilt, but also our sinful patterns of life, but you are transforming us. And we look forward to the day when Jesus returns to bring a renewal to the whole world, the creation, and to completely finish this renovation project in us. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.